Good evening. My name is Alan Leroy, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Haitian Roundtable. I am honored to serve as moderator of tonight's discussion. Haiti, where do we go from here? On behalf of the Haitian Roundtable, NYU Silver Institute, and the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, we would like to welcome all of you to this important policy discussion about a topic that is near and dear to our hearts, Haiti. We are extremely grateful to US Representative Gregory Meeks for joining us this evening. He not only represents the 5th Congressional District here in New York, but is also the chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee. Haiti is in the news and not in a good way. In July, President Jovenel Moise was assassinated. In August, an earthquake killed 2,200 Haitians and injured 12,000 more. And most recently, we have seen humiliating images of Haitian migrants being chased along the Texas-Mexico border by men on horseback, a scene evocative of slavery. In fact, thousands of migrants have been deported back to Haiti, and we know that others will be returning to the US border seeking asylum. Our objective here this evening is to discuss the following topics with Chairman Meeks. How does Haiti come out of this political economic turmoil and what is its future? What role should the United States play? What US government policies should the Haitian diaspora support? And how do we make our voices heard? To explore these questions, we have assembled members of the board of HRT who will join the chairman to discuss these pressing policy issues. At the conclusion of these roundtable discussions, each of you will get the opportunity to have your questions answered by Chairman Meeks. We ask all of our guests to submit their questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. But before we tackle these issues, let's first introduce Chairman Meeks, who will thereafter give brief opening remarks. A native son of Harlem, of East Harlem, Gregory Meeks is a graduate of Howard Law School and is a fellow member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity. Before being elected to Congress in 1998, he served as an assistant district attorney, as well as in the New York State Legislature. The congressman's constituency includes the second largest number of Haitians who reside in the borough of Queens. Making his mark on American history, last December, Congressman Meeks was elected chair of the House Foreign Relations Committee, becoming the first black member to hold that important post. Throughout his tenure in government, Chairman Meeks has been an important voice an advocate for Haiti and the Haitian community. So without further ado, good evening to my distinguished brother, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you very, very much uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, and I wanna thank all of the organizers of this event, uh, the MacSilver Institute at NYU, uh, I know the Haitian Roundtable, uh, the greater New York chapter of Lynx Incorporated, of which I'm a connecting link uh, because of my wife being a link. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for inviting me to participate in this important dialogue today. Uh, and uh, you know, I know there's a lot of ground to cover today. So I'm gonna just keep my opening remarks uh, very brief. So as all of you know, the situation in Haiti um, has rapidly deteriorated over the last few years. Sadly, uh, President Moise's assassination in July, the devastating earthquake in August, and the heartbreaking Del Rio uh, repatriations that began last month have only exacerbated 
the multi-pronged existing crises in Haiti, including public health concerns with COVID-19, a surge in violence and gang activity, gang activity, as well as political unrest and lack of respect for the rule of law. Just last Saturday, we learned that the armed guard gangs had kidnapped 16 Americans and one Canadian requesting $17 million in ransom. So my thoughts go out to the victims and their families and I pray for their safe return. And unfortunately, crimes like these happen to Haitian people every day. And we are just as moved by the suffering of all those preyed upon by these gangs. In the last few months, I've committed to creating space in the House Foreign Affairs Committee for people of Haitian, the people, for all the people of Haiti, and our response to the challenges that they face. And while I look forward to continued engagement with the Biden administration on matters concerning Haiti, it is important to me that we engage with the public to continue to assess our critical policy towards Haiti. It is clear much of our current practice is a holdover from the previous administration and is in desperate need of a fresh perspective. And I'm concerned that using business as usual policies to address what is happening in Haiti is counterproductive in a country which is demanding closer ties and an ear toward the recommendations of civil society and grassroots groups. So rather than working with the broad, the representative Montana group that has a well-respected and thought out plan for a transition government in Haiti. Our embassy in Port-au-Prince has too often shown support for maintaining the status quo. Too many stakeholders are calling for elections when everyone knows that the country is simply not ready for free and fair elections at this time. And for this reason, I'm eager to hear from everybody today. And I'm hopeful that your questions and this dialogue and others like it move us toward finding a durable Haitian-led solution with the human rights and needs of the Haitian people at its center. So I wanna make sure that we're having a dialogue and we're talking and we're working collectively together and let the people of Haiti, not the gang leaders, not the individuals who are potential continuing and pushing forward policies of corruption, but the real people of Haiti and their voices, not the United States of America, imposing our will and saying that we just have elections for elections sake, but the people of Haiti, as I see happening with this commission and loving to, and, and looking to talk to you about uh, so that we can really uh, make a difference in what's taking place. So I'll stop there. Uh, and let's have a dialogue and conversation about what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, the people, I love that. Thank you so much. So let's move right to the roundtable conversations with my colleagues from the Haitian Roundtable. Our focus will be on three roundtable topics in this order. Number one, the migrant crisis, which will be led by Dina Simon, and Hervé Vixamar. Topic number two, Haiti's political instability and elections, which will be led by Reynald Levesque and Claudel Said. And topic number three, the last topic, is the aftermath of the earthquake, which will be led by Rodney Leon. As my colleagues are introduced, their bios will be available in the chat function of Zoom. And remember, you can post your questions using the QA function at the bottom of your screens. And now I will turn things over to my colleagues, Dina Simon and Hervé Vixamar. Hello, Mr. Chairman Meeks. It's great to be here with you. As you know, the flow of desperate Haitians to the US-Mexico border has become a crisis. The Biden administration is forcibly returning to Haiti thousands of asylum seekers, continuing a policy created by the previous administration. There are fears that thousands more are preparing in Colombia for another surge to the U.S. border. 
While thousands of Haitians have been released into the U.S., their fate is uncertain. What steps can Congress play in resolving this crisis? So, you know, as soon as I found out about the Igro, you know, the terrible deportations taking place on our border in Texas, you know, I took immediate action to express my outrage and ask for clarity from the Biden administration. And last month, I wrote a letter with Homeland Security Chairman uh, Benny Thompson to Secretary Blinken and Secretary Mayorkas uh, asking for clarity on the situation and urging the administration to immediately halt repatriations to Haiti. Now, we had set an October 1st deadline. And unfortunately, we have yet to receive a response from the administration and the repatriations have continued. Just today, when we were meeting with the Congressional Black Caucus, we had our friend, my friend and colleague who's part of the administration, Cedric Grichman there. And we mentioned to him that we're looking for a response because sending individuals back to Haiti at this point in the state that it's in is only creating more folks to go join gangs actually. I also continued my engagement on the issue earlier this month when I invited Ambassador Dan Foote, the former special envoy to Haiti who resigned after the repatriations began to speak at a public briefing in front of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And as chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I'm going to continue to shine a light on this issue and make sure that there's not, we're not going to let the Haitian issue fall off anyone's radar. I also think that as members of Congress, we need to approach this situation in a more holistic way. That means taking a closer look at what the root causes of migration are in the first place. We need to make sure that our current policy towards Haiti is not negatively impacting the Haitian people and causing them to leave. We also need to work more collaboratively with our partners in the region. You know, the Haitian migrants in Del Rio were not coming from Haiti. They were coming primarily from Chile and Brazil. And many of them had lived in these countries following the devastating uh, earthquake of 2010. So my office has received reports from the Panamanian embassy in July that warned us about impeding Haitian migrate, migrant caravan was coming through. And the incredible, dangerous Darien region between Colombia and Panama, we knew that they were coming there. So these are not bilateral issues. We need to work in a multilateral way with countries throughout the region to increase our collaboration and address these issues head on. And we need to make sure that it stays in the forefront. And I can tell you as doing briefings, doing committee hearing both on the subcommittee and the full committee, it's gonna be what we, you know, we, we, we move forward uh, and work on in a, in a very big way. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you, Chairman Meeks. Um, question for you. The Biden administration has been using a law called Title 42 to refuse Haitians entry on health grounds. At least one federal court has ruled that the use of Title 42 is inappropriate. I'd like to know what is your view on Title 42 and how can the United States respond more effectively to the migrants who will be arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border? Well, um... Let me say this. In February of this year, I led a letter that was signed by more than 60 of my colleagues in Congress calling on the uh, Homeland Security uh, Secretary, Mr. Mayorkas, to end the practice of expelling migrants under Title 42. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was the Trump administration began misusing Title 42 to shut down access to our asylum system. And unfortunately, that practice still is in place today. And we're seeing firsthand the destabilizing effects it is having on a country like Haiti. The policy, plain and simple, is inhumane. 
and unnecessary. And countless public health experts have made it clear that the United States has the resources and the tools it needs to safely process people seeking protection under our asylum laws. And I understand that last month, a federal appeals court granted the Biden administration's request to stay a district court ruling that blocked the government from expelling asylum seeking families from the US under Title 42. But it is indeed incumbent on the Biden administration to treat asylum seekers humanely and withdraw its appeal. I was with the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Joyce Beatty, today. And we are looking to go back to the White House. We went immediately to the White House once we saw the despicable pictures of those under the bridge. But since we have not heard anything back from the letter that Mr. Thompson, Chairman Thompson and I had written, we are demanding to go back into the White House and have a further conversation. We have not forgotten our brothers and sisters and this Title 42, which started under the Trump administration. I solidly believe that it is inhumane and we've got to get rid of it in the Biden administration needs to move forward in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your responses. We would now like to transition the conversation to the next focus area, the current political instability and free and fair elections in Haiti. And joining the chairman for this round table are Rena Levesque and Kodel Said. Thank you, Dina. And nice to see you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. Over the past two decades, Haiti has steadily descended into chaos in spite of the continuous involvement of the United Nations and the core group, which is comprised of the United States, France, Canada, Brazil, Spain, Germany, the European Union and the Organization of American States. It is evident that the UN stabilization mission and the core group have not produced the expected outcome. Unfair US trade policies instituted on the presidents Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton destroyed the Haitian rice farming industry and contributed to Haiti's forced urbanization and famine. What should the United States do to make up for the damages it has caused and to help ensure that elections in Haiti are free and fair and that the results reflect the will of the people of Haiti? So, Unfortunately and sadly, uh, the United States government has made a series of misguided policy decisions uh, towards Haiti throughout history, as far as I'm concerned. And I see it as part of my job to try to push the Biden administration to begin to right the ship. But we all know there's a lot of work to do. So to put it simply, I believe that the primary policy that the United States should hold in respect to Haiti is, as I said earlier in my opening, is to listen to the Haitian people and the Haitian civil society. For well, Haiti's certainly going through a horrible, destabilizing, complicated crisis. I'm hopeful to see a strong, yet organized and vocal civil society beginning to coalesce around raising concerns for the world to hear. And I believe we need to listen to the concerns outlined, for example, in the Montana Agreement and not follow through with, I know is our misguided attempt to support a rushed election that simply cannot be free and fair at this time. 
And I also think that if we continue our policy of supporting elections at all costs, we will be repeating the same grave mistakes we've already made at least twice the last decade. So I think that we should learn from our history in Haiti in order to ensure that we are not making those same mistakes. And as I said for months, a country where more than 20% of the country lives under gang control, and that number is growing every day, cannot hold anything close to a free and fair election. So to me, now is not the time to just do what we did in the past. Now is the time to listen to civil society and the Haitian people to make sure that we get this right. Now, one of the things that I think that we have to do is to make sure that those that are on the commission and working, that they are safe. Because we know we see, and I've heard of some of them who want to do the right thing are being threatened by some individuals who don't want anything to change in Haiti. So if there's a role to play is to listen to them and figure out how we can also make it safe for them to continue the mission of what they're doing. It is absolutely key and essential that we have security for those, for example, of the Montana group. Good evening, Chairman Meeks. Um, good evening. Governor, good evening. The governor of, of the Central Bank of Haiti recently acknowledged that the bank would run out of reserves with, uh, without the money transfers from the Haitian diaspora. In 2020, global remittances of Haitians living abroad, about 22 thirds of global Haitians live in the US, top $3.8 billion. Additionally, unfair US trade policies have contributed to the disastrous imbalance between Haiti's imports and exports. In the past year, Haiti imported 3.4 billion in products versus exporting only 700 million in goods. How can you leverage your leadership position, Chairman Meeks, in the US Congress to bring, as you say, a multilateral approach to addressing these unfair policies and help ensure that the Haitian diaspora, which has historically been the backbone of Haiti's economic survival, has a seat at the table in the efforts to plan a better financial future for our country? Yeah, good question. And, um, you know, I, I think it's absolutely critical for the Haitian diaspora to be involved in all conversations surrounding the bolstering of the Haitian economy. Uh, I, I think it's clear to all of us that Haiti is critically underperforming in its economic output. And I think there are steps that Congress and the Biden administration can take to help rectify this. We need to do everything we can to support the Haitian people as they are fighting for a stable civil society, included transitional government before elections can take place, as I said earlier. And it's impossible to have any sort of economic growth when corruption runs rampant and gang caused insecurity is at the level it is today. Just can't do it. Part of the thing that I continue to do, I continue to have conversations with Haitian business leaders and entrepreneurs, many of whom told me that the current unprecedented levels of instability in the country are far from ideal for any economic prosperity. I also think that the now you talked about multilateralism. I think that the Senate needs to pass the Haiti Development Accountability and Institutional Transparency Act. This is a bill that was written by my friend and colleague, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, um, which calls for a comprehensive review of all US assistance to Haiti since the 2010 earthquake. And I believe through a review, 
it can be instrumental in helping us figure out what works and what hasn't worked in our assistance towards Haiti. It can also spark some, 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 some new ideas on how to facilitate capacity building for the Haitian private sector. Now, I marked this bill up through the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee this year, and it passed in the House over the summer. And now I'm talking to Senator Schumer in the Senate to see if we can get it passed on the Senate side and bring it to the president's desk so he can sign it. That's our goal, and we're talking about it. You know, and try to get it done now through through the Senate. I appreciate your insights, Sharon Meeks. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the current level of aid to Haiti has been focused primarily on the health and relief efforts, given the cycle of health crisis and natural disasters over the past decade. There has been a severe lack of funding for governance judicial and democratic institutions that can help Haiti support economic growth through self-governance and without corruption. How can the United States increase funding to the same level as humanitarian aid to specifically target initiatives that support governance, infrastructures, and democratic initiatives in Haiti? Well, you know, First, I think that we have to have a wholesale review of our assistance program to Haiti. And for that reason, you know, that, that, that's why I've been a champion of the Haiti Development Accountability and Institutional Transparency Initiative Act, which I just talked about. The United States has always proven itself to be a capable partner that is willing to provide a, a, a helping hand. But what is necessary, though, is to ensure that we are not wasting taxpayer dollars and that the funds are getting to the organizations who are best equipped to use them. Because if we waste it and it doesn't get there, then we'll find individuals will not want to continue to give the aid because it never gets to the people or in the right hands. So that's why I will continue to reiterate my number one priority on Haiti which is to listen to the Haitian people. You know, following the 2010 earthquake, the U.S. was working primarily with international relief organizations who were not experts on what was going on on the ground and were not listening to the concerns of the Haitian people. There are countless organizations based in Haiti and led by Haitians that are focused on supporting governance, infrastructures, and democratic initiatives in Haiti. That's why I've been in constant communication with Ambassador Sassoon and soon to be, uh, 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 soon to be Charge Merton. And I've got a little thing that's going on there also that I can't talk about here, imploring them to listen to the Haitian people to help ensure that we are funding their important initiatives but we gotta look at the mistakes that we made in the past and not make the same ones. And we've gotta make sure that we give to organizations that the Haitian people know and that can make sure the resources are getting where we intend them to go. So we'll continue to focus in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your insights. Even more than the political turmoil, the August earthquake has had the most immediate impact on Haitians. And now my board colleague, Rodney Leon, will be joining the conversation to discuss with the chairman the aftermath of the earthquake. Mr. Chairman, great to be here with you. Good to be As here. you're aware, thank you. On August 14th, 2021, a magnitude 7.2 earthquake struck the southwest of Haiti, affecting an area of approximately a million people. 
To date, USAID estimates $32 million have been spent on humanitarian aid to support the people in Haiti affected by the earthquake. Given that USAID and the government of Haiti estimates that there have been over millions of people, that over certain millions of people have been uh, affected, 130,000 houses have been damaged, 119,000 people requiring safe drinking water, 2,200 dead and 12,000 injury, and damage to infrastructure. What is the level of technical and financial support that the United States should provide to help address the massive scale and scope of damage to Haiti's physical in infrastructure? And how can a process inclusive of Haitian and Haitian American professionals be established to arrive at a master plan to support this effort? Yeah. Um, earthquake in August was devastating. My heart and prayers went out to all who were affected. And um, you know, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, Administrator Powers. And I was grateful to her to, and the USAID who responded immediately with important humanitarian assistance and emergency rescue missions. But, but I, I think that we need to do a better job of helping countries like Haiti plan for long-term climate resilience. If you go to Haiti today, you'll still see informal living camps of thousands of people who were displaced by the 2010 earthquake. And to me, that's simply unacceptable. Now, I don't have a set number on what our exact assistance should be. I don't know that, but, I, but, but, but what I am certain is that we need to consult again with the Haitian people to figure out what else we can do to rebuild infrastructure that can sustain these sorts of natural disasters. We may need to provide and help with certain expertise. Climate change is for real. So it probably is time to take the opportunity. It might be prime time and prime opportunity for collaboration with states, for example, like California, where there's infrastructure that is strong enough to withstand earthquakes that are even stronger than the ones that rocked Haiti. That's a collaboration that we may be able to do with that state because we cannot afford to make the same mistakes we made in 2010. And, you know, I know I've said it once, I'm gonna say it again, you may hear me say it again. That's why, you know, my hope is that we can make it clear to the Biden administration that we need these kinds of partnerships and need this kind of working to make a difference in Haiti. Well, thank you. As a follow-up to that regarding infrastructure, how do you think, how can Haitian American civil society organizations like HRT most effectively utilize the substantial knowledge and resources of its membership to advise, consult, and partner with the US government in planning and implementation of these intermediate and long-term critical infrastructure policy in Haiti? This is particularly important for enhancing the nation's resilience to natural recurring catastrophes, which exacerbate political instability, poverty, and mass migration. So I didn't hear all, can you, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, something happened to my computer. I didn't hear the last. I'll repeat, uh, how can Haitian American civil society organizations like HRT, the Haitian Roundtable, oh. most effectively utilize the substantial knowledge and resources of its membership to advise, consult, and partner with the US government in planning and implementation of intermediate and long-term critical infrastructure policy in Haiti. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. You know what we should do? We should talk. First, the first thing, we should talk. You know, as I mentioned, we need to come up with smarter approaches to our reconstruction and resilience building efforts in Haiti. 
And so I know that it's a great opportunity for Haitian American civil society groups to partner with Congress and the United States government to make sure that the recovery process is getting the attention and support it requires. I've said it before, we need to learn from our assistance mistakes that followed the 2010 earthquake and ensure that we're applying a new and more effective and Haitian-led assistance policy. You know, when I talk to, whether it's my colleague and friend, Yvette Clark or Hakeem Jeffries, or even uh, 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 my sister in my, Miami, um, Frederica Wilson, all those that, you know, we all are talking and working together and think that the most effective and the more effective way is making sure it is not just the United States alone without the inclusion of the Haitian-led uh, assistance policies from civil society and others. So um, I look forward to working with uh, Haitian American civil society organizations. I look forward to consulting with you and partnering with you. And that's why, you know, I'm thankful uh, that we're starting to have this conversation this evening. Thank you, Chairman Meeks, for the opportunity to engage in this critical discussion. At this time, I'd like to turn things back over to our moderator, Helen Leroy, who will lead our Q&A session. Thank you to my HRT board colleagues for their questions. Now we'll turn to questions from the audience. You can still post questions in the QA section of Zoom and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So let's get started, uh, Chairman Meeks. Uh, our first question is from Numa Luis and, it, and it, I'm gonna read it right here. As a congressional staffer, I had the opportunity to listen to the testimony of Ambassador Foote a few weeks ago before the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And one main takeaway for me was Chairman Meek stating that it was time that the US revisits and revamps our policy vis-a-vis -vis Haiti. So my question is what do you make of the Biden administration's recent appointment of Ken Martins, Mertens, who is widely discredited in Haitian society because of his perceived bias in picking Haitian leaders? Well, you know, I've had that conversation with the administration. I'm gonna be honest about that because I would be lying to you if I did not say that I had some concerns. And, um, um, but I will say this, there's a new assistant secretary to the Western hemisphere by the name of Brian Nichols that was finally cleared through the Senate that I've worked with extensively in other parts of Central and South America and developed a relationship with him. And he also tells me that he will personally be involved in what's taking place in Haiti because I was advocating and still am that there be another special envoy uh, assigned to Haiti. So if, if you're asking me, do I have some concerns? Yeah, I do. If you're asking me, will I be watching though everything that is or is not taking place at the embassy? I will tell you that I will be. And I will tell you that I will be blunt and honest with whatever the assessments that we come up with uh, was taking place there. And if it's just a repeat of what has taken place in the past, of which I continually say was a failure, then we will be continuing to put pressure on the Biden administration. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that response. 
let's jump to the next question. The next question is from Corrine Jocelyn, and it reads, Congressman Meeks, what role can the US or other countries and appropriate international systems play in addressing illegal arms and drug trafficking in Haiti? Both are areas that have contributed to the current crisis. You can play a big role. I mean, that's one of the reasons, look, I had requested and one, you know, and hate that he he did he decided that he could not stay. Uh, Ambassador Foot, uh, that's what he was doing. He was talking to people that had not been talked to before, um, and uh, trying to make sure that we would be able to uh, work with it and not have any kind of military intervention of that sort. No, we don't want to do that. But to you know, train and have individuals. Uh, who would have the ability to stop some of the arms, et cetera, that's moving into Haiti. So that's another reason, you know, and I'm going to continue to uh, articulate what my position is uh, to the administration, to my friend Brian Nichols, to uh, uh, Secretary uh, Blanken, uh, because uh, it, it is a part of what's contributing. Now, I, I've said, to many a group, until we get serious about those individuals who are going freely back from Haiti and Miami and the United, you know, and other parts of the United States, you know, because we should know that who some of these folks are that's running the guns, et cetera. And we need to go after them. And we need to make sure that those who are violating, they're already violating not only Haitian law, but US laws, and we need to put them in jail and show that those individuals who are running the gangs are not free to go with impunity. Because when I talked to some young people in Haiti, which I did a few months ago, they dare not vote or do anything in society for fear of their lives and fear of the gangs. And the guns that get in there. So uh, again, it's a focus of mine. It's a dialogue that we've got to continue to have. And my hope that we look and move in a different direction than we have in the past, because clearly it has not worked. And do it in a multilateral way. We need to engage others also. So it's not just the United States. Because if I were to be honest with some, the United States has lost some credibility because of past mistakes. You gotta fix it. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, so we'll continue on. We have a few more really great questions. This one is from Natalie Ray. Thank you for speaking on this important situation U.S. intervention is fraught with negative history, but we are dealing with a failed state and lawlessness due to the drug trade from Central America that has taken hold of the country over the last 20 years. Democracy building aside, we need the rule of law, but not another right-wing regime that ignores the immediate and long-term needs of the people. Is there some middle road working with the international community to establish law and order led by a local committee since parliament has refused to rule? Well, um, that's what I wanna figure out. Now, I, I, I don't equate the two exactly, but My staff might get upset with me for saying this, but I but but it's 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 what I believe. But when I look at what took place in the past with Colombia, drugs, gangs, until we had a partnership to try to make sure that there was security, there were no elections that were credible. 
people felt locked in, afraid of being kidnapped. Roads were closed, couldn't do, couldn't bring in anything for humanitarian purposes. It was only when we started working collaboratively so that the voices of the people of the country could be heard that things start to change. Now, there's still a lot of work to be done there. But I go to some places where folks never would have gone and would have worked that are now thriving and the economy is thriving. So I'd like to have further conversation and discussion with some to figure out on a multilateral way. I'd like to talk to the commission and see what they think is the best way to bring in and have uh, a, a real um, ending of impunity for those, because quite, quite frankly, I think our intelligence uh, and the intelligence of, and people of the uh, 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 citizens of, of Haiti, they, 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 they know who some of these people are. Let's get them. We know who some that may be in the police department. Let's get them. I mean, I got to tell you, I went down to Haiti along with Ambassador Thomas Greenfeld. We were only on the ground because we didn't feel secure for a little over an hour. So how do you think the people that live there on a continuous basis are? And they didn't have the kind of security that we had with us. So I think it's something that we gotta be really serious about. And it may take a little time to do it, but we, that should be the focus in my estimation. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, we'll jump to the next question on climate change from Linda Haley. Considering the tremendous impact of climate change on Haiti, is there an effort to secure a meaningful infrastructure plan to build a habit habitable, sorry, habitable <laughs> environment that is humane and livable? This also needs to consider a transition government until elections are viable and a regional migration strategy is implemented. Are these concerns being considered? Thank you. Well, I'm listening to the commission on part of what you said and what they think that they need and want. So I'm gonna wait to get that. But I do think that uh, island nations like Haiti, other countries like on the continent of Africa should have a voice when we talk about climate change and get the assistance that's necessary. I intend on going to Glasgow and Scotland for COPS too, to deal with climate change and to try to make sure that countries like Haiti have a voice and people are looking at what, what can be done so that island nations are protected from the devastation of climate change and we utilize all of our energies to save this place that we call the planet Earth. So yeah, I'm, I, that's what I'm gonna be advocating when I, while I'm in uh, Scotland. Uh, we're looking at now and, I've, and, and I was in um, Portugal not too long ago and um, with NATO. And I was talking to the NATO allies and those countries that have the wherewithal as opposed to just putting um, uh, 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 charges on some of these smaller countries without coming up with solutions and dollars and cents to give the latest technology to help save the climate, 
we've got that responsibility. So I think that uh, that's going to be a conversation that takes place uh, in Scotland at COPS too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is from Julia Dorville. I'm a junior at NYU Gallatin School of Individualized Studies. I've been working with Ga Gallatin to organize a celebration of Haitian culture and heritage to change the media's perception of Haiti. I want to convey that we are more than riots and more than earthquakes. We are not a shithole country. I would like to enlighten the world on all Haiti and Haitians have done to inspire American culture through some sort of sit-in, protest, or demonstration. How do you recommend I best go about this? Well, uh, I think that my computer's making all this noise. I don't know what's happening here. Um, getting together and organizing. What one of the, one of the things that um, for me was heartwarming is I was meeting with some of the young people, some students and listening to their thoughts and their ideas and what they were doing and what they were learning and putting into practice. We need to make sure that those things are in the media. We need to make sure that they could see the real talent of the Haitian people, the natural entrepreneurships the entrepreneurial spirit of the Haitian people. That needs to be seen. And um, I think in, in to one degree, when we have those uh, areas to highlight, you know, getting them on social media so that they can not see, just see some of the things that, uh, you know, the, the, so they can see the essence of who the Haitian people, the overwhelming majority of the Haitian people, who they are, the talent that they have, and the potential that exists there. Because I do believe that if there was a level playing field, Haiti would be exemplary. Thank you. Uh, so Chairman Meek, first uh, consideration of your time. Uh, do you have any more time for a few more questions or should we wrap it up? Well, I'm just have, I'm it's a little late. So let's, let's do a, one or two because I've got another event actually that I've got to jump on in about okay. 10. You know, so I'll be about five minutes late for them. So I can be on time with you. Okay, thank you. So we'll, we'll hit one more. Uh, what assurances do we, the US have that assure us that the Montana group is actually capable of carrying out their established agenda. I ask as someone who is currently living in Haiti and was here during the post Martelly transitionary government that is partly responsible for setting Jovenel Moise in place and led to the general population questioning his five-year mandate. Well, I don't want anything that's self-imposed or pushed you know, the reason why I talked about the Montana Commission is because they're all Haitians. It's not something the United States put together. It's not something that uh, anyone other than from, from what I've seen thus far is other than people who are committed to Haiti and they're living in, in, in Haiti. And that's what I'm trying to listen to. And I've been asking folks, you know, uh, um, who are in Haiti, um, not necessarily part of any administration or any particular party or anything of that nature, uh, is it all inclusive? 
and is you know individuals having the opportunity to participate. So basically, you hear me talking about it so much is because that's what I've gotten back from a broad section of the of the Haitian people, and that's what a spasset of foot was doing while he was on the ground talking to non-traditional people to see what they th thought and to make you know those determinations. So there's no absolutes, you know, so I can't say absolutely one way or the other absolutes, but it is by having dialogue, conversation, listening to people in a broader sense that I come up with, we need to support uh, the Montana group and others that are participating therein. I don't want it though, it's not because I'm pushing the Montana group and I'm saying the Montana group has to exist. It's not a United States led thing. They don't want the United States to lead it. They just want the space to do it themselves as Haitian people. That's what's important to me. Because as you said, you know, rightly so, you know, we push these elections and then the United States or others try to determine who should lead Haiti. That's not really the voices of the people of Haiti. I don't want to get involved in those domestic uh, decisions. Thank you. Thank you for taking that, that last question. Um, so unfortunately, we've run out of time. We thank everyone for your questions. They were all fantastic. Chairman Meeks, thank you for spending so much valuable time with us, given how busy things are in Washington, DC. Would you like to make any closing remarks? The only thing I'll say in closing is that I want to thank you. Um, uh, very much. I want to thank Rose and uh, my guy, uh, Brian Simon, who is, uh, you know, like part of my family uh, and uh, who I uh, lean on and depend on in a very, very big way. Uh, I want to, you know, thank all the others who came together today to make this event possible. I want you to know that I really understand that there is an ongoing crisis in Haiti and that it will require significant attention by the House Foreign Affairs Committee that I lead and by the Biden administration that I support. So you can rest assured that therefore I intend to keep meeting with the uh, concerned communities and the diaspora groups to have as many conversations as needed to deepen our understanding of the situation at hand. Just as I'm talking to you, I've talked to the group of Haitian American elected officials throughout the United States of America. I'm meeting with diaspora groups. One moment. Also. So my intention is to offer our support to the people of Haiti as they find solutions to instability so that we could forge a new and democratic way forward. So let this not be the last time we have a dialogue. Let this not be the last time we have conversation. Please feel free to call me in my office for thoughts, ideas, and you know what? As in anything, sometimes we'll agree and sometimes we may disagree. But we've got to keep the issue on the front burner. And I promise you, as chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, it will be on the front burner. We're not going to let it just disappear. So again, thank you for this opportunity and peace to each and every one of you. Thank you, peace, peace with you too. Um, on behalf of the Haitian Roundtable 
NYU's McSilver Institute, and the Greater New York Chapter of the Lynx, we would like to extend our thanks to Chairman Meeks and all of you for participating in this discussion. A recording of this meeting will be circulated to all attendees in the coming days. God bless and good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Great job. Good night. Thank you, Chairman Meeks and 06. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Great job. Good night.